Hi there, everybody. Thanks for joining us on today's webinar. Um, today, we're going to be talking about getting started in cybersecurity. We're going to talk about beginner tips, certifications, and career paths. My name is Camille Dupuis, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Before we get started, just want to go over a few things. Um, as audience members, you are muted. However, we invite you to ask questions at any time. Um, we'll kind of pepper those in throughout the presentation and save some time at the end to get to those questions. Um, and to do that, use the control panel from GoToWebinar and go ahead and uh, type us a question at any time. Um, so talking about CPEs, for those of you that aren't familiar with CPEs, um, what those are are continuing professional education credits. And whether you need to earn these or not, um, it's a great, great idea to keep learning in the industry. Um, so what you'll do is go ahead and submit a certificate of completion um, via that link there, and you'll also receive that in your follow-up email. Um, but go ahead and submit for a certificate if you're looking for CPEs, and we'll send that to you. Um, you can also check out some of the eligibility requirements um, via the second link there. They all vary by what certifying body you go through. Um, so make sure you check on those to see if um, this webinar will qualify for CPEs for you. So let's go ahead and move on and we will meet our speaker. Um, today, we're very fortunate to have with us Keytron Evans. Um, Keytron is a managing consultant of KM Cybersecurity. Um, he's also an InfoSec Institute instructor. Um, so really great to have you with us, Keytron. A um, little bit about him. He is regularly engaged in training, consulting, penetration testing, and incident response for government, um, Fortune 500s, small businesses, and you know everything in between. Um, in addition to being the lead author on a best-selling book, um, Chained Exploits, Advanced Hacking Attacks from Start to Finish, um, you'll see Keytron on major news outlets such as CNN, Fox News, and others on a regular basis. Um, and he's a featured analyst on a lot of those concerning cybersecurity events and issues. For years, Keytron has worked regularly as both an employee and consultant for several intelligence community organizations on breaches and offensive cybersecurity, um, as well as attack development. Keytron also provides um, world-class training to some of the top organizations in the industry. Um, so as I said, great to have you with us, Keytron. Really a knowledgeable, uh, knowledgeable person that's gonna help us out through this um, and kind of just help us dive into all things cybersecurity career paths. Um, so thanks for being available, Keytron. Why don't we go ahead and uh, get started kind of talking about um, a high level look at jobs in the cybersecurity field. Um, numerous studies have indicated that there are not enough qualified professionals to fill all the open positions. Um, and that problem is expected to grow in the coming years. So although that's bad news for organizations, good news for anyone interested in the cybersecurity career. Um, so if you wanna get us started on that, Keytron, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely, Camille. Thank you for the introduction. Um, this is definitely uh, an area that that's you know we've seen some concern in, and, and a lot of the customers that I have are are actively recruiting uh, cybersecurity people because of the fact that we do consulting for them. They uh, look to us when they're looking for to staff up and things like that, and uh, I, I see that being a bigger and bigger uh, concern in organizations where they're looking to you know, to bring in staff that already have some cybersecurity skills. And that's kind of taken a, uh, a change over the last 10 or 15 years or so, whereas before, uh, you know, when we teach classes, for example, uh, when I get a chance to do that, 10 years ago, I would have a class of 20 people and, you know, 15 of them would have five plus years experience. Now it's, I'm lucky if I have at least one student that's got more than a year's worth of experience in anything security related. So um, that just shows you that there is an influx of people trying to fill the roles. Uh, we've we've been busier than ever, but at the same time, you know, it's the, the roles are still not being filled. There's still a huge shortage, and it's obviously going to grow. So um, I think this is right on point. Now, Keytron, why do you think there's kind of such a skills gap there where we don't have these workers that we need, um, and and why is it continuing to grow despite talking about this through the recent years? I think it's a combination of a lot of things. One, um, we, we're processing more data using more electronics. 
uh, doing more things across the internet, you know, using social media and things like that for business um, more than we ever have. Um, so because of that, we leave a bigger data footprint. We require more processing power, more compute, uh, which means more resources, more devices, um, which means more things that need to be secured. Also, uh, we have a, a very quick and, you know, um, I like to say agile media cycle now. So if, if you're an organization that gets breached, it only take minutes before the whole world has knowledge of that breach because of Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter and those things like that. So that's caused a lot of organizations to actually have to step up and do something about uh, whatever security problems they may have. So as a result of that, again, they're looking to hire people. Uh, they're looking to even get people inside the organization trained up. I would say that more than half of the people that I've trained over the years uh, to do cyber were people that were doing other IT related jobs and they kind of got forced into or, you know, pushed into doing security or doing cyber. So I think that's that's it's a combination of those things. Um, we're using more data than ever. We're doing more computing than ever. And for that, because of that, there are more roles being opened up to handle um, that in increased dependency on data and computing. Sure. So that makes sense. And, you know, kind of want to talk about these people that we need to do the jobs. How do you become um, someone in the cybersecurity world and and uh, the different stages of working towards that uh, profession can vary for a lot of people. So can you kind of describe um, you know, what you can do now to start getting into the cybersecurity field and and if you're not already um, enrolled in any courses or certifications or anything like that, kind of just give us an overview of, of how you think someone um, would commonly get started. Well, so that's the good thing about it. I think you can start from pretty much any point. I don't think there's a um, designated, you have to go this pathway to get into it because you know, my path is pretty well documented. I've written about it and uh, people read it. So my path into cybersecurity definitely was not a traditional path. For example, I didn't come from a computer science background. I didn't, you know, my, I didn't major in computer science per se. Um, that wasn't really how I got into it. You know, I was doing some computer aided drafting stuff and got into some civil engineering and you know that got me into computers more and then from that point i just decided that i wanted to do this and i literally just made a spreadsheet of all of the different knowledge areas that i would have to conquer uh to be good at cyber and i just started to knock those knowledge areas out uh slowly and um and you know it started with certifications actually it was a i got into a um an a plus certification you know type of uh course and after that, I jumped into a network plus and then I went off on the Microsoft uh, rabbit trail of doing all the Microsoft certifications. So the certifications introduced me to um, systems and more importantly, you know, taking those classes, I got to network with other people that were already doing those jobs. So it, it gave me opportunities, um, you know, not just to to get job interviews, but also just to see what people were asking for. Uh, because it's one thing to look at a job application or a job ad that, you know, HR posts on the Internet, but to talk to an individual that's working on that team that may be the actual person that's doing the hiring, it's a different perspective to hear what they're looking for uh, in someone that they're going to hire. Because if you look at like the job ads, mostly what you get is like, here's their minimal, this is what PR, HR is looking for. Um, but if you have these things, you're going to stick out a lot more. You really get that insight from talking to the individual. So I think that just starting anywhere, you know, um, if you're coming right out of high school, don't feel like you have to go get a, a four year college degree in computer science to get into cyber. You can literally come right out of high school, um, jump into the right certifications, you know, start networking, going to some of these conferences and things like that. And you can find yourself in a very nice entry level cybersecurity role uh, right out of high school. Now, thinking about, um, you know, you said that sometimes people don't have college degrees or, or something to get into the cybersecurity field. And thinking about that, um, you know, let's say someone is still in high school or still really early on in their career. Um, are there any classes or, or 
things that they should kind of look for to um, get into the industry maybe without getting that degree? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's a lot of free material out there that you can find, you know, just the biggest thing is research. One of the things that's that's uh, I find most interesting and surprising is when I, for example, if I teach a certified ethical hacker course, I'm always amazed when I get a student in who's done zero research. Like they they didn't even know they were going to get a certification out of it. You know, they just showed up for class. So uh, one of the things I like to encourage is before you take any class, especially one that you pay for do some of your own research on the topic area because that's that might tell you whether or not you want to even spend the time or invest the time into that class or in learning that particular skill set so um absolutely you know looking at um you know where to come in i think that's a good place to start is definitely the the um the entry level certs and the free classes i encourage everyone you know we the classes i teach for uh, you know, different organizations throughout the world. All those classes cost money, but, um, you know, look at some free stuff. Before you spend money, look at some of the free stuff out there. It's not going to give you nearly the same quality level. Um, you're not going to have the reputation. For example, I've got a lot of years of experience. It's going to be hard to get uh, someone with that much experience in front of you, uh, you know, just looking at stuff on the internet, at least in a, in a package way to tell you specifically the things you need to know. So look at the free stuff, uh, research and find out, you know, what the certification is about, what the knowledge area is about. And then from that, you can uh, essentially, um, you know, go ahead and, and then pick what you want to spend your money on, so to speak. Sure. And so, so people that do choose to get um, a bachelor's degree to kind of accompany their cybersecurity um, studies, what are some of the most common um, titles, is that going to be computer science degrees or or what do you uh, usually see in that realm? Well, it used to be computer science degree, uh, management of information systems, business information systems. Those were like some of the older terms. Now we're seeing uh, software engineering, uh, you know, software development or some of the degrees that are coming out. And believe it or not, a lot of the colleges are now uh, shifting to cyber focused degrees. I know Penn State has a pretty uh, extensive cyber program. The University of Auburn has a, you know, their cybersecurity school of excellence. They have a, an entire uh, four-year track dedicated really to cybersecurity. So we're seeing more and more colleges uh, beef up their cybersecurity offerings and starting to actually offer degrees that have the word cybersecurity in it. So uh, it used to be primarily comp sci, um, you know, network engineering, system engineering, uh, software engineering. But now that's transitioning. We're seeing more and more roles where uh, people are coming out with uh, degrees that are more cyber focused. And that touches on another point that we're going to get to here in the next slide or so, which is you're, you don't have to start out with anything computer science related uh, to come out of college and get a good you know, position in cyber. And um, we'll talk about that in just a second. Sure. So let's uh, let's move on and, and kind of talk about um you know, in lieu of necessary, necessarily a full degree or something in cyber um, certifications. So I know that's an area where you have a lot of um, expertise and knowledge and, and some certifications of your own, I believe. Um, but when you're looking at certifications, um, there are a lot to choose from. I know at InfoSec Institute here, we offer, you know, over a hundred different courses. Um, but Let's talk about how important are certifications, um, particularly for those just kind of starting out and looking to either land their first job or transition um, into security. Right, absolutely. So, you know, it's that's an interesting and a, and a very good question because the thing about it is you have really two lines of thinking uh, in the in the whole IT security, cybersecurity industry, whereas you have this these group of people that that kind of you know. Uh, slam certification and say it's not worth it, it's a waste of time, it's not useful. And then you have on the other side people that, you know, that, that swear only by certifications and they try to collect as many as they can. But what I would say to that is, so if you take, for example, you know, my foray into it, I remember when I was taking the MCSC uh, version 2000, you know, 2001, something like that for the MCSC certification track, and there was uh, something that was that Microsoft introduced with that track, which was something called volume shadow copy services. 
And what that means is you can, um, if you set that up, you can now right click any file or folder uh, on your desktop or on your computer and you'll see uh, a previous versions tab. And if you click that tab, you can actually roll back to previous versions of that document that you might have been working on. Like, keep in mind, this was a huge, huge, huge thing because, you know, I knew people whose job it was basically just to go get backup tapes and restore Word documents that the CEO had uh, inadvertently destroyed or added something to that he didn't want to and didn't want to go back and undo all the work. So this was a huge thing. And I got introduced to that actually taking an official Microsoft certification course. Um, this was something that completely changed the way that I architected uh, you know, systems and things of that nature. And it's something that I probably wouldn't have known about um, if I hadn't you know, jumped into that certification course. I wouldn't have known about it as quickly as I did. So what I would say to that is, first of all, don't make it your goal to go out and get as many certifications as you can, as quickly as you can because there is some value to taking your time and actually learning this stuff versus just nailing down search, you know, taking these brain dumps and things like that and getting yourself the certifications really fast. Or even if you take a bunch of classes back to back to back to back, it's, you know, if, if, you're, if you're looking to me to, to uh, at an interview and I'm looking to hire someone, you know, I'm gonna look at the fact that you got 12 certifications in a year and on the plus I'm gonna say, well, that shows some motivation uh, and some serious, you know, dedication to trying to get into this industry. And that will weigh heavily uh, on my decision. But at the same time, I'm going to look, question the experience because if you've only been out of college a year or if you've only been tra chasing the cyber dream for a year and you got all the top certifications within that year, then it just tells me that you did kind of like a very uh, quick sprint to get these things and it might not translate the, to hands-on skills, which is what's really lacking uh, in the industry is people that can actually sit down to the keyboard and do things. So um, look at the certifications that are technical, look at the ones that force you to sit in the seat, put your hands on the keyboard and do things, because that is where the biggest, um, you know, deficit is in the industry, uh, as far as what I see. So um, A plus, net plus, these are good ones to kind of get your feet wet in the industry to start with, to kind of just see you know, what it is you wanna do. Um, and another thing that I often tell people to do is even if you don't meet the qualifications to get the certification, go look at the CISSP, look at the track, look at the subject areas and even get some, download some books and things like that and read up on that topic because what CISSP is for me, or what it did for me, it was one of my first certifications in security, is it gave me a very broad look at a lot of different cyber avenues, right? Like there's management, there's secure software development, there's network and communication security, there's cryptography, there's all these different areas. And the CISSP was like the one that gave me the biggest view of all that. So from that, I chose to go into technical cybersecurity, which would, would pen testing and incident response and those things. So traditionally, the recommendation is do CSSP last because it's like the granddaddy of certifications. Look, I'm going to challenge that, flip that line and think it on its head a little bit here. And I've said this for years. Um, if you go back and look at some of the tech exam articles that I wrote um, years ago, go ahead and look at that first because it is kind of a security, cybersecurity management certification which means it gives you a very narrow or very shallow wide view of all the different things cyber. So with the A+, with the Network+, plus, with the CCNA, which are all entry level, um, add that is something that you might want to look at because you want to take the technical stuff and figure out which avenue you want to take with it. It's uh, kind of how I would look at that. So, Keytron, kind of going off of talking about um, the experience and the the knowledge you need to take some of these certifications, um, for anyone looking at taking, I would say, you know, a variety of certifications, whether it be those real entry level ones that we have kind of listed on the screen there, or something a little bit more advanced like CISSP, what is the base knowledge you need to really understand the course? So, I would say the base knowledge for things like A+, plus, Net+, plus, uh, CCNA, some of the Microsoft entry-level courses, is you just need the, you just need one, just be a little bit above what an, an average end user would have, right? Like if I were to say, hey, tell me your Windows IP address, 
you should be able to do that without me having to give you step by steps. I should just be able to say, hey, what's your Windows IP address? And you should be able to, to look that up, you know, uh, run IP config and get that IP address. I shouldn't have to say, click start, click run, type CMD, hit enter, now type IP config, forward slash all. I should just be able to say, what's your IP address? And you should be able to tell me that. Um, also, if I said ping google.com, you should, you should know how to open a command prompt in Windows and ping google.com. To me, that's like where you need to be coming in. If I asked you, hey, Camille, reset your Windows password to be Keytron, um, you should know what the steps are to reset your password, or at least be able to, within a minute or so, Google the instructions and figure out how to do it from that. To me, that's where you need to set yourself as a starting point. And then after that, you know, you can, it, you can kind of build from that, having that basic skill level. So I would say nowhere near as much as what, like I said, desktop support technician would know because you're trying to get into the industry, but somewhere between that and your average desktop user, because you have to have a clipping point to start with. Otherwise, a lot of things just might be too far over your head. Sure. And so, so we have some people asking, you know, I don't necessarily have those skills or I don't know um, how to get to the starting point where I'm ready to take a certification to learn more. Have any ideas for resources or, or ways you can uh, just kind of advance your basic computer um, and overall, you know, security technology kind of learning so that you're ready to take some of these? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so there's a lot of, um, I would say, some things that you can write down <clears throat> that you should go look at is instead of looking at how do I get into cybersecurity, because that you came here for that, so we're, we're telling you that. So what that really means, if I want, if I could quantitate that for you, one thing is start looking up things like how do I learn Linux command line? How do I learn Windows command line? How do I learn Windows PowerShell? Like start looking for those tangibles because those are the, the entry level and basic things that are gonna set you up for A plus, net plus, and any security search that you might do after that. So start with the basics. You know, Even if, if you're completely coming from a, a non-technology field, let's say sales, all right? Let's just say a salesperson with the only technical experience they got is using Salesforce um, and email. I would say start off with, hey, let me go look up the fundamentals of computers, like how do computers work? And I know that sounds basic, but literally Google that, how do computers work? And there's some good stuff on Quora, there's some good stuff on uh, Stack Exchange that you can look at, just little articles on how computers actually work. And then from that point, start getting under the hood just a little bit, well, you know, what is the Windows command line? How do I use that? Uh, what is the Linux command line? How do I use that? And more and more, I'm finding myself recommending what is cloud services? How do I use cloud services? Um, you know, right now, you guys can do this right this second. Uh, open your browser, go to aws.amazon.com or azure.microsoft.com or cloud.google.com and set yourself up a cloud service. Now, you can set the service up for free, and it's very, very extremely basic as it tells you how to to set the service up, but set that service up. Start learning how to build yourself virtual machines inside that service. And look, just trust me on it. I know that sounds complex. When I say go to go set up a Microsoft Azure account or go set up a AWS account and start building virtual machines in a cloud environment, that sounds like I'm saying brain surgery, but it really is extremely basic. And all of these organizations have very, very good tutorials on how to get started. Um, just setting up those basic environments because it does two things for you. One is it already puts you ahead of the curve because now not only have you heard of cloud services, you're actually utilizing it right away. And then secondly, it gives you the flexibility with almost no cost. For, if you do it right, no cost. You can create a Linux environment and create a Windows environment that's not on your machine that you can practice in. You can break things. You can tear things up without the fear of any uh, adverse reactions or uh, things happening to your actual computer by doing that. So that, to me, that's, you know, I've kind of um, streamlined my advice for that question over the years, and that's what it's come to now. Start off with, you know, how do computers work? Google that, look at some of the articles, and then start looking at how does PowerShell work? How does Windows command line work? How does Linux command line work? 
and pair that with cloud services. If you just take those things and spend the next six months or so working on refining those things, you will put yourself exactly where you need to be. And I would say even a little bit ahead of most people that are successfully coming into this industry now. And so when people, you know, when they finally kind of grasp this knowledge that they need to um, understand how to take these um, certifications, when they are preparing for the actual certification, you know, and the one they've researched and the one they choose, would you recommend um, going with self-study materials? Have you seen success with that? Or or do you kind of compare it to taking a course, um, a boot camp or a training where you're really diving into this specific certification? What do you kind of think about that? Yeah, that's a good question. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a tough question because, you know, I, I provide training for InfoSec and for other places. And, you know, let me just tell you my take on the, the value and the difference. So, you can do most of these certifications or a lot of these certifications via self-study but the difference is is that when you take a course number one the course is geared towards preparing you for that certification so you're going to be told exactly what you need to know um, to successfully conquer that certification exam secondly you will be able to draw from the experiences and the interpretations of other people in the class and one of the most fascinating things that I observed early in my career of uh, teaching was sometimes the best questions, like the, how you get your best answers, is from questions that other people ask. For example, if you and Jeff are in the class, Jeff might have a question, but his question actually asked the question that you had in a way better way than you could have ever asked that question. So sometimes just being in a group environment, uh, in a structured environment where there are other people trying to achieve the same goal, you will get insights, you'll get phrasings of questions and, and the way questions are presented and answered that will stimulate your brain and make you absorb the material in a way that you just won't get from self-study. Uh, so that's, that's, a, that's one side of it. The other side is most certification courses and most trainings will offer you some type of um, you know, free reset or something like that if you don't pass the certification. In other words, some type of uh, certification guarantee. So if you're self-studying and doing it on your own and you go and you don't pass that exam, well, you're, you're kind of out there on your own you know, to pay for that research and to pay to uh, go back and learn that material again. So I would look at self-study as something that you should do. Uh, maybe you know, look at it as a precursor to taking uh, a boot camp or something like that. Because there's two lines of thinking with boot camps. One is come in knowing nothing and we're going to get you ready by the end of the week. Well, that happens uh, more often than not. And we're definitely equipped to do that. But it's less stressful on you as the student or as the individual coming into it. If you use your self-study time ahead of coming into a course to where when you come into the course, you have some idea of what to expect and you can absorb the information a little bit better. Uh, if, if there's 10 things that you need to know and you come in knowing none, well, that means you have to learn a lot more things in that five days than someone that came to that course knowing three of the 10 things already, uh, if you want to uh, look at it that way. So um, that's, that's kind of my advice on that. And I think that kind of ties in nicely to your point about, you know, oh, you can go back to back to back to getting all these certifications um, and then, you know, look really impressive with with all of these uh, letters after your name. Right. You know, CCNA and and um, CISSP, all that. But, you know, kind of looking at the value of really taking the time to absorb these absorb these skills and kind of communicate with one another in a class kind of environment will help you. Um, per se, kind of to, you know, like I said, absorb that knowledge and and really have the hands-on skills to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and I, and I don't want to be sound hypocritical here because I have over, I have about 100 certifications myself. Uh, but to be clear, some of those certifications I got over years, and then some of them were requirements, right? Like sometimes you're in a job or you have a specific contract that requires you to possess certain technical certifications to be on that contract or have that job. So I have a lot of certifications. I'm definitely not saying don't do it. It's just that make sure you do it in a structured way. And the most important thing is, is actually challenge yourself to do a lot more than is required to uh, get into the industry or be in that job role. And I see so much of that where you get all these people 
that are coming in and they all have the exact same skill set. They've got this cookbook definition of what they think it takes to be in cyber and they all have that skill set. But you know what? Set yourself apart because I had to do that again. When I came into the industry, I, I didn't come from a traditional comp sci background. So coming into it was a little tough because I was around people that had a lot of experience. You know, I would have guys saying, oh, well, you know, I worked on the Cray supercomputer and, and I worked on an IBM, this, this, this and that back in the day. And I was using punch cards, you know, kind of just making you feel like you don't know anything because you just got into it. And at the same time, I had, you know, younger people that had just, you know, taken like a five year computer science course or degree program uh, come in and say, oh, well, you know, I can code this and I can code that and I can code circles around this and make this application do that. And it wasn't until one day that happened, I said, oh, well, look at this. I can hack into this bank account without any login credentials. Um, and then that's when I kind of realized, oh, yeah, this is a, this is a skill set in of itself. Uh, the programming background helps, uh, but it's definitely not a requirement. And you definitely want to focus on setting yourself apart by uh, learning more things than is required. For example, I gave the recommendation to go set up a, an AWS account. Well, you know, don't just do that. Like in your own, on your own, go ahead and, and you know, shoot for the AWS technical certifications, like dive into it all the way. You know, make yourself the total package. Like don't, don't come into the industry with a basic skill set that checks all the marks and expect to be treated like you're something special because you're not if you come in and your skill set matches everybody else's. You know, one of the things I tell even when I teach classes, my students is, look, you know, I, I can tell you about SSL. I can tell you about how uh, exploits work. I can explain to you exactly what happened to Equifax, you know, how they got breached with the um, the Apache struts vulnerability. But you know what? I can sit down, fire up a VM within two minutes and I can demonstrate to you the Apache struts exploit and how that organization got exploited. And that's where you should strive to be. Even if you don't have a role that requires you to do hacking or pen testing, if you're in an advisory role, why not challenge yourself to say, you know what, I'm gonna set myself aside as a CISO or as a manager or as a entry level person and that I'm an entry level person that can actually demonstrate what an attack looks like. In other words, I'm just saying challenge yourself to, to be a lot more than just what it requires to get into the industry. Um, getting into the industry, honestly, the best way is being a lot more than what it requires to get into the industry. And I'm kind of trying to give you a roadmap as to uh, how to do that. So kind of wrapping up here, talking about, you know, we've built up the steps to how to get into the industry, what you need to do to prepare yourself for a certification, how to move into taking that certification. But what the ultimate goal is here is to then get into a career, right? So can you kind of go over talking about um, if you have any high demand areas that you see or really growing in the future that people might want to strongly think about considering, um, you know, as a facet of the cyber realm? For sure. So the areas that we come up short in um, application security, you know, and I mean technical AppSec people that can uh, write secure apps, can test applications to see if they're secure, uh, can pen test uh, applications. So that's a that's still a field that's very, very underserved. Um, incident response, that's probably one of the biggest growing things. Uh, as organizations get breached, as the breach cycle, you know, the life cycle of an organization getting hacked and then how they respond to it, the whole media cycle, that's becoming a field in and of itself uh, to be able to go into an organization and uh, help them deal with that or, you know, in your organization, be able to deal with it. Because that's in, in my practice, in my business, that's the area that's grown the fastest. Uh, I've, I've got service more RFPs for that this year than just about anything else. Uh, because our pen testing is kind of automatic. We have clients, we get new clients, we know what that cycle is. But the thing that's showing the most growth for me in my practice is the uh, incident response, you know, where we, and I mean technical incident response, where we'll go in uh, after an organization has been breached and walk them through uh, what they need to do, all the way from hands on the keyboard to dealing with HR, PR, legal. Uh, we just kind of come in and take over the whole process and kind of hand it off to the team and do knowledge transfer. So definitely AppSec, 
uh, information uh, or incident response are some areas. Reverse engineering is still a big area. It's very niche, but it's also growing a lot because if you take organizations like FireEye and Palo Alto and some of these others that have these huge teams of reverse engineers, they're constantly hiring. The FireEye uh, job ad for uh, hiring reverse engineers to work on their Flare team and some of the other teams, that thing has been a constant, we need people. Like for the last three years, it's not been not advertised as we need people. So application security, reverse engineering, incident response, and even pen testing. You know, I, I still say pen testing because for one, it is a great way to start a technical cyber security career. Um, because you will have to learn some forensics, you'll have to learn some hacking, you'll have to learn some reporting, and it kind of gives you a good place to launch into other directions from, which is exactly what happened to me. And so following up with um, a question from one of the audience members, um, what do you see in the world of digital forensics? Is that kind of moving forward or where are we at with that? Well, it is, and that's a, that's a great question, by the way, whoever asked it, thank you for that question. Um, so what's happening with differ or digital forensics and incident responses is, is you can see in the industry it's you're seeing it being referred to as digital forensics incident response or DFIR and that's because those things are you know a lot of the forensics is kind of being merged under uh, incident response because if you look at most of the forensics effort now a lot of it is being driven towards responding to hacks or events that happen inside an organization and when you look at most hackers, they have developed a pretty uh, good skill set of not leaving behind evidence, specifically on a hard drive. When you look at a data breach, when you look at um, things of that nature, sometimes the best evidence is going to exist in memory and in traffic. And hard drives are usually, you know, the, the least fruitful place uh, to look for that. So digital forensics, I think, is making that transition to where uh, the importance on, you know, hard drive forensics is kind of going down for the simple fact that, number one, look at how little information we're storing on our actual computer hard drives now. We're all moving to cloud. We're all computing uh, online. You know, even when we do uh, child exploitation investigations, which we still assist with a lot of those, a lot of the information and a lot of the evidence is, is coming from cloud services and things like that. Uh, simply because a lot of these guys know not to download videos now, they just stream them, right? So there's a different way to look for that evidence. Um, a lot of organizations, even if you still host your data on site, you've put a lot of it inside virtual machines. So when you look at it from that perspective, there really is no physical hard drive. You can't go to Amazon and say, give me InfoSec's physical hard drive that their web server is running on because it, it doesn't exist. Uh, it's all a big virtualized environment. There's a hard drive. There's hard drives that you could try to image, but go to Amazon and ask for that and, and let me know how what response you get back. So I think the, the forensics is definitely growing, but it's growing into being a necessary part of incident response, right? So it's kind of one of those things that's being more and more attached and aligned uh, with that than just about anything else. And when we say incident response, it, it, can, it doesn't necessarily have to be a hack, right? Like inside your organization, uh, when there's a need for forensics, a lot of times it's because of an incident and it could be an internal incident where someone did something internally that they shouldn't have done. Uh, that usually equates to being an incident as well, which is why if you look at, you know, most of the, the uh, forensics things out there, it's it's paired now with uh, incident response. And so kind of talking about all of these um, different roles that you said are kind of up and coming. Uh, what would be some of the job titles that people would be looking for um, in organizations, you know, when they're looking to get into um, some of these facets that you outlined as up and coming? Some of the job titles, you said? Yeah, yeah, maybe just kind of, you know, um, help them have an idea of what they'd be doing day to day from from the job title listed. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you'll see titles like information security analysts, entry level security analysts. Uh, entry level SOC analyst, junior SOC analyst, uh, junior pen tester, um, you know, and, and even a lot of times just going into a non technical security role just to get your feet in the door uh, to where you can observe those technical roles and kind of learn about it is a preferred way of doing it as well. So um, things like, you know, documentation specialist uh, or 
someone that, that comes into an organization and is responsible for incident management, because a lot of times incident management does not require a technical skill set. Um, you're just managing the incident, managing communication, uh, managing who's doing what, almost like project management for incidents is kind of what incident management is. Um, so it's not necessarily technical, but you can jump into a role like that without really a lot of technical skills and then use that to budge your way into a technical role. Um, so those are just some of the ones that are common out there. And look, one of the slides you had earlier said, uh, don't, piv don't fear pivoting from your job to uh, a new career. Still, things like, uh, you know, entry level network support technician, desktop support technician, these are still great pivot points for you to get into uh, and then move from that point into a cyber uh, career. If you're already in those roles, then just start to beef up your cyber skills, your technical cyber skills, start adding that stuff to your skill set and start advertising it. You know, go to meetups, go to the OWASP meetings, go to the, the ISACA meetings, go to the ISSA meetings, um, go to go to the uh, IntraGuard meetings and, you know, talk to people, uh, sh tell them that you're interested in cyber and have some skills when you go. You know, that's that's the number one thing, because at the end of the day, if you meet me at a if I'm speaking at OWASP or something and you meet me and you say, hey, I'm entry level, I'm looking to get into cyber, I'll probably offer you, hey, well, let's do a, a two hour Saturday Skype meeting or something like that. Or, hey, you know, let's meet at the Starbucks um, on Saturday for an hour and let me see where you are. And, and you know, I'll, if I can help you, I will. And look, at if you if you've heard this webinar and then you come to me six months from now, and you say that, and then I set you down, and you have not learned anything technical, you can't show me anything, then that means you're not really driven uh, towards actually trying to accomplish these things. Um, so make sure that you look for, don't look for roles that actually have the word security in it necessarily. If you can find those entry level, junior, those are good, but also don't underestimate the value of roles that aren't necessarily security related. Uh, you know, look for security consulting organizations that do security consulting and then look for some of the roles that they have and a lot of people will go into those roles and then bud themselves into one of the security consultants in that organization um, so i wouldn't focus even so much on looking for specific job titles just you know make is is the case with all jobs uh research the organization make sure they're doing what you want to do and then find a way to get in there whether it be through some other job role or not Sure. So kind of wrapping up on that, we've got a lot of great questions and, and Keetron, you did a great job helping to um, answer a lot of the questions we have coming in. So we're saving a few minutes here at the end. Um, so feel free to, to send us more questions. Um, we're going to real quick talk about, um, you know, if you are interested in a certification, um, how to get started with doing that. And then we'll save time um, and go through the, the last questions that we have. Um, so kind of looking at, you know, we talked about the differences of taking a certification course versus self-study. And if you are ready to kind of have that immersive um, practice with other people training opportunity, I um, just wanted to let you know about InfoSec's courses real quick here. Um, so we have a few different ways that you can train and really great because they can meet any schedule. Um, so you can do Flex Pro, which is our most popular. And that's an um, boot camp training format where you get award-winning training from us with the convenience of being able to train um, from anywhere using your favorite device. Um, and then we offer a variety here that you see um, of courses, so we do do some public training boot camps. So that's when you're you're live in class um, with an instructor, and those are hosted at different uh, locations across the United States. Um, and then we also offer a self-paced, computer-based course um, called Flex Basic. So really a great few options to look into um, if you are thinking about taking a certification course. And as Keytron said, one of the great things that um, InfoSec Institute offers is that exam pass guarantee that you see on the bottom left side there. And so what that means is that if you do not pass the certification for the course um, boot camp that you're enrolled in, if you don't pass that certification test on the first time, um, we will pay for you to retake that for a second try. And then we also have some of the industry leading exam pass rates at 93%. So 
a pretty good chance that you will pass that exam after taking a boot camp course with us. Um, looking at um, October's special, you will have access to 90-day replays of your videos from your lessons, which is great for um, reabsorbing that knowledge and kind of, as Keytron said, um, taking time to soak some of that in. So moving on, um, looks like we have a few more questions streaming in. We saved a few minutes. Um, so if Keytron, let me uh, look through the questions here and, and see if... Um, Sure. We can kind of talk about about some of these that we need to follow up with. Um, so let's see. I think one interesting point here is um, somebody said a lot of these job requirements always require degrees. Um, and we touched on that earlier is how a lot of people don't necessarily go for a degree before a certification. But what would you say about um, necessarily if there's a way to surpass that requirement via skills or, or kind of talk to us about that? Yeah, I would say, you know, if you see a job that says, you know, degree required, um, I would say go ahead and apply anyway. You know, say, look, I've got these technical skills because the very first security job I had was a job that required a degree that I did not have. Sure. Um, but I just applied for it anyways and said like, hey, like I know you asked for a degree here, but like I've got some skills that, really sound like exactly what you're looking for here. Um, maybe we can balance this out with, with those skills and with my experience. Um, so, you know, I would say go ahead and apply for it. Now, there might be some HR people on here saying, oh, well, it's great, you're giving us more work. Well, I mean, you know what, that's what your job is. Like your job is to, is to feel, part of your job is to take those applications and pass the ones on that seem beneficial and, you know, discard right. the ones that don't. So. I want you to at least put your hands on mine, you know, if, if it's a role that I really want. And the other thing too is, if you look at a lot of the innovative, uh, forward moving and very progressive organizations and companies, that's becoming less and less of a requirement. Like even if you look at Google and Apple and some of these places, they're more so focused on look like, what can you do? Like, let's we're gonna sit you down in a room for an hour and we're gonna see what you can actually do since you're applying for a technical job. Um, so look for, I would say, look for those opportunities of go ahead and apply for the ones that say you need a degree. If you're going to make mad or, or uh, tick off the HR people, you know what, that's that's just part of it. Um, but go ahead and apply. But look, try to seek out the roles that are more open to, you know, you not having a degree if that's something you're interested in. And sure. the thing about it is, you know, and I have to say this, too you know, make sure it, it's a role you actually want to be in, right? Like, don't just apply mm -hmm. for something. If you're changing careers, if you're already solid in your career and you're looking to change now, don't rush it, you know, right. take your time and try to get into a role that you're actually going to enjoy doing. Because I can tell you, you know, I'm my mind is, is boggled with a bunch of stories of where people have uh, went to apply for a job. They were told they're going to be doing pen testing and then they get the job and they're sitting there, uh, doing IA work where they're checking off checklists on vulnerability scans or something like that, which is totally not what they wanted to do. So now they're less happy than they were in the job that they came from, you know? So right. I would say just make sure you take the time. If if there's a job that they're so strict about the requirement of having a degree and that matters more to them than anything else, then it just, maybe you shouldn't work, you don't want to work there anyways, you know, um, or maybe you don't want to work for whoever put that job at out there. Um, so, you know, consider those things. Uh, look at it as a win. You know, you you might have died <laughs> working somewhere that's a little bit too um, fundamental in their thinking uh, to give you the exciting career that you're looking for. Sure. And so kind of tying that in, sometimes those skills that you have are maybe more important than, you know, the skills and experience that you have are maybe more valuable than that degree. And, you know, if you can have the opportunity to prove that to um, where you're applying. I think that's a great way to, you know, kind of show how cybersecurity just with the amount it's growing and with the amount of open positions, it kind of shows how it's transitioning and just, um, you know, where those pockets are of, of the skills that they need. And, and uh, you know, I think maybe people will be opening up a little bit more to, okay, maybe a degree necessarily isn't the right, uh, the right thing, but this skill is. Um, yeah, so I think, 
that's that's kind of a cool a cool transition in the cybersecurity world. Um, so let's see, we have another question. Um, so this person is currently a network engineer, and they want to move into the security realm. Um, what kind of advice do you have for someone kind of making a transition where I think they probably, as a network engineer, have a lot of the skills that we talked about um, as far as computer skills, um, but maybe talk about some of those security skills that they want to um, hone in on as well? Well, that's a great question. And the good thing is, is that what's, that's where, what my background is. That's where I came from uh, as well as network engineering. So for the most part, you definitely want to download Kali or, or spin up Kali inside a cloud VM or something like that and start working on things like scanning. You know, how do, how do I scan within MAP? You will find lots of free tutorials out there on how to do that. Um, but just start getting your hands on the tools because having a strong network engineering background puts, you know, about 20% of the stuff that we teach in like, for example, the Certified Ethical Hacker course are things that you would already know as a network engineer. So a lot of, of having that background is actually a leg up on most people that are coming into cyber because part of the first part of pen testing or the first part of breaking into an organization is you have to do reconnaissance and scanning, right? And to understand how scanning works, to understand how looking at that network from the outside across the internet, how that works, you have you need a fundamental understanding of how networks work. So I would say from a network engineer role, just start working on uh, getting yourself set up with, you know, uh, the tools and the techniques. We call it TTP, you know, tools, techniques, and procedures um, of how threat actors work. Like, just look at it from that perspective. Don't even look at it as I want to get into cybersecurity. Just look at it as I want to learn how hackers do what they do, and that will be a nice sure. add-on to your networking background. Kind of tie in those skills that you need to make that transition then. Yep. Sure. Um, looks like we have time for just a couple more, couple more questions um, before we wrap up here. Um, but another one looks like it's another question about um, kind of transitioning into um, an identity analyst position. Um, they're currently a systems administrator. Um, what would that transition look like? Identity analyst. Um, well, so that analyst title can be very uh, tricky and deceptive sure. because a lot of times it means you're literally just looking at logs uh, to see, you know, looking at people as they authenticate and identify themselves as they, as they log in the systems and things. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it could be a more technical role where you're doing hands-on analysis work of, um, you know, that type of thing. So it really depends on what the role is. But coming from what role was it? System administrator? Um, yes, it looks like systems administrator. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be that big of a transition at all because you're really going to probably be starting off using some type of software packages and things like that that are designed specifically to help you do that job. And I think the learning curve is something that's kind of uh, really baked into that role. Sure. Um, Keytron, what courses do you teach? And kind of people are wondering more about what expertise, um, you know, obviously you have a lot of expertise with, with all your certifications and all your experience, um, but what courses do you focus on? Um, so certified ethical hacker, uh, advanced pen testing, which is mostly exploit development. It's, it's built around teaching you how to develop exploits from scratch. Um, I do teach the incident response um, mobile and web app pen testing, uh, sometimes the mobile and uh, computer forensics. Uh, I teach that from time to time as well. Um, there, we have like an OWASP course that InfoSec does that I'll teach from time to time, you know, usually on an as need basis. And uh, the advanced malware reverse engineering, those are the primary ones that I'll teach. And when I say that, like, for example, some of those I haven't taught in like two years, but sure. in my portfolio of the ones that I would teach, uh, those are the common ones. I mean, I've done, you know, you know, again, different training organizations have different needs. So I've right. done like the SSP and C-Risk and SISM and, and a lot of the management level certs. But just to be quite honest with you, that's not my forte. Like it's, I like sure. to put my hands on, I like the technical stuff. So doing those, my CSSP classes are a lot more uh, demo driven than most people see ISSP classes. Right. 
Um, well, thank you for that. Um, looks like we've got time for just about one more question before we um, end the hour here. Um, so kind of we, we touched on this earlier, um, but as far as um, do you think skills are better than a certification? You know, are people going to require to see that that certification or, or do you think it's acceptable that people demonstrate um, these skills but haven't necessarily been tested via a certification to get a position well, maybe? All right. So let's let's look at that from two perspectives. So one, if you're coming to me to interview for a job and you sit down in front of me, um, mm -hmm. definitely I'm going to be more driven towards a skills and a certification, okay? Right. But understand that in a lot of job roles, you gotta have the certification to even get in that chair to sit down to show me what your skills are. So I think the way I look at that is certifications are primarily a door opener. And then, you know, certifications can get you to interview, the skills will get you to job. And sometimes a certification will actually get you to job, to be quite honest with you. In some organizations, mm -hmm. they have such a big requirement to have so many certified people that they are almost hire you just on the fact that you have the cert. But what keeps you the job role and what allows you to progress is having the skills that go with that certification. But again, for me, the biggest value of taking a certification course is the preparation and the things that you learn in the course and the, and the networking connections that you make. So it's not the cert, it's just the, the skill sets that you acquire preparing for that cert. Sure. Well, Keetron, thanks so much for joining us. I know this was a, you know, a really informative session for everyone, and it definitely just uh, gives people that confidence and that um, knowledge on, on how they might move into this um, booming world that is cybersecurity. So we appreciate you making time to, uh, to give us this session today. Um, and I want to thank the audience for participating and, and giving us some great questions. And, and we hope that uh, we were able to help you with your journey in cybersecurity. Um, just wrapping up here, if you know, if you're interested in looking at more of the courses we offer, um, we also have some resources, um, you know, just some some free things that can help you learn more about the industry. Um, go ahead and check out infosecinstitute.com. Um, otherwise, give us a call at 708. 689-0131 and, and somebody will be happy to um, talk about you know what course might be right for you if you are interested in in hopping into the industry. Um, so with that we hope everyone has a great rest of your day and you can watch for a recording of this live session in your email later on. Thank you everyone and a special thanks to you Keytron. Thank you.